Hi everyone, welcome to our very final talk in our um, Now Gallery digital talk series and tonight we'll be discussing how uh, through the work of Nian Manandar and Theo White, um, how they challenge the aesthetics of youth. So um, Nina and Theo have both worked with Now Gallery and produced commissions for the Human Stories series. So we'll delve into their practice and also talk about how their work navigates evolving British subcultures. Uh, just before we start, I'd like to just um, welcome the Now Gallery team as well. They will be uploading useful links um, throughout the presentation. And there'll be a section where you can ask uh, questions towards the end of our discussion. So to introduce Nina, first of all, um, Nina's photographs explore contemporary global youth identity and the meaning of style. And she is the author of What We Wore, A People's History of British Style, um, and has worked with the likes of Vogue, Show Studio, The Fader, Getty Burberry, Adidas, so many people. And Theo White was born in Jamaica and is a London-based art director and stylist. And his work strives to give a platform to Black queer youth. And um, it also aims to subvert stereotypes around race and gender within contemporary Great Britain. And Theo has worked with Gucci, Nowness, Off-White, Dazed, Tate, um, and also with artists such as Wizkid, Cosmo Pike and AJ Tracy. So perfect. You guys are probably, you know, my some two of my favorite photographers, and definitely the best place to kind of talk about how um, youth subcultures have been evolving. Um, but before we get into that, um, just to, you know, give us a few words that describe you and your style. I don't know who wants to kick that off. Oh, three words. Um, I I think um, I guess the three words that I was thinking probably hybrid um, because um, I'm a mixed heritage, half English, half Nepalese, and that seems to um, kind of have influenced a lot of my work and what a lot of my projects are about because a lot of them are about identity. Uh, the second one would be London. Um, sort of born and bred in London. I think it's it's kind of really, it's something that I'm con constantly kind of exploring in my practice. And the third one would be observer, because um, I'm just, I just enjoy um, observing and taking things in and responding. Brilliant, thank you. Um, three words describe um, mysterious. <laughs> um, mysterious, um, a wanderer I'm always wondering I'm always you know think you know looking into things and deeper like the knowledge and meaning into things so I'm always like wandering in my brain and getting lost and um third I'd say a dreamer I can't that kind of wandering and dreaming it's in the same world but a dreamer I think it's important to dream um you know dream dream wide and far awesome Thanks. And when did you both start experimenting with photography? Was there, was there a particular event or person that influenced you? How did you get into photography? Um, I've kind of like always had an interest in like fashion and photography from a young age because my mum, um, who's one of the most fabulous women I've ever known, um, She's always she'd always buy like you know Vogue magazine and like Harper's Bazaar, Tatla. So I was always found myself like sneakily reading them behind her back. So and I I think you know growing up in Jamaica and coming to England at a young age, um, I was always dreaming. I always knew there was another world out there apart from the world that immediate world that I lived in, which is quite close near like in the Jamaican circle. So. I think, you know, from seeing those magazines, that kind of informed my journey into, you know, styling and photography. Um, but I think I, like, assisted a stylist, Johnny Blue Eyes, for a few years. And I think that from then I kind of, like, figured out that I want to take my own images. 
and you know and moving forward that way so I think maybe that's how the journey started. Um, I've kind of got um, photography in my family a little bit my uncle in Nepal is a photographer and um, I remember going to Kathmandu when I was 16 I was just I was doing a GCSE photography and um, he gave me one of his cameras to use and that was the first time I really used used a kind of proper it was one of those old school um you know um manual slr cameras um so but i i don't know i kind of i'm interested in photography but i guess i'm also interested in research and looking at imagery and that's always been part of what i do um and using photography to explore style so a lot of the photography is kind of a means for me to i guess when i was a teenager style was a big way for me to express myself and my identity so the two kind of went hand in hand and as a starting point when you start to kind of build an image is it kind of the um, idea of what it is you're going to construct or is it an image comes to mind and you know what it is you're going to pull together um, for me I'd say it's definitely the idea rather than the image the image kind of comes second I'm interested in like exploring something or going to a place or finding something out or having using photography as a tool to, to kind of a tool of inquiry to find something out with and the image kind of comes second yeah i think for me um i kind of like you know my images come together after you know a period of time of like you know you know, trying to, you know, wondering, like putting stories and narratives together, and, like building a the image. But um, I think, um, it's, I don't know, it depends on the project and what I'm doing. But I kind of spend a lot of time investigating, you know, casting is really important for me in aspects of images as well. So okay. I kind of it starts with the casting and then, you know, the actual setup and you know, what I'm trying to do with the image. So I think, you know, casting is an important starting point. And so we're going to look at um, both your practices and so you both have um, been commissioned for Human Stories. Nina, you've been commissioned twice for Human Stories, first in 2016 with um, the edition that looked at intimate spaces in and around um, South London, um, particularly the Greenwich area. Um, and this was a really first kind of beautiful um, series where um, a number of photographers got together and we asked them to look at areas around Greenwich, but from a contemporary perspective. And you chose um, Thamesmead. And, um, you know, you, with human stories, you're kind of given free reign to go away and come back with a, a kind of conceptual idea. And um, I think what, what came back was really not what I'd envisaged of Thamesmead. If you know, Thamesmead is, um, you know, known for its kind of dystopic uh, architecture. It's the area that, you know, Clockwork Orange was filmed in. And this series was just absolutely beautiful. So um, I wanted to understand why Thamesmead was a draw for you. Yeah, um, I'd actually, I'd sort of, I'd been commissioned to do something, um, just some portraits in Thamesmead um, and I previously and I spent a little time in the area um, and I was just fascinated by this idea that um, it's kind of like what, how the community, what, what they were doing, sorry I'm having, <laughs> um, I went to an event with um, basically um, lots of, it was a comic relief event for young people and I just met lots of people that were in the area and I, I met, I came across these two girls that were, um, that were dancers and I kind of stayed in touch with them. It turns out they, they on the day they sort of did this um, baton twirling type dance, but it turns out they were um, Indian Bharatnam dancers. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Um, and they lived um, in Thamesmead and I thought they'd be really interesting to document in the space. Um, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's such a beautiful series that, uh, um, you know, it has this very kind of fairy tale like quality. Um, tell us a little bit more what it was like kind of working with these two young siblings. Um, yeah, I guess Thamesmead is kind of famous for its um, for Clockwork Orange 
and for yeah like you said this kind of this dystopian feel but I wanted to really actually get to know the communities and the people that live there and understand how they made their mark on the landscape um, and all the different I guess it's all the different cultures that exist there people kind of sit from the outside and they see this kind of um uh, you know big estate and they don't really know anything about what goes on behind them there's so many cliched images of social housing that are produced but mm. I wanted to do something really celebratory which really it came from building a relationship with the subjects and getting to know them and finding about more about who they were and um and I wanted to kind of show, I think I wanted to show the different cultures and, and communities that already um, existed in Thamesmead. And um, rather than at the same, there was a big regeneration um, output going on there at the moment. And they were trying to bring in a lot of culture where I wanted to show that there was already a lot of culture going on there mm -hmm. and in people's everyday lives. And there was so much beauty in the costumes and in the dance. And I wanted to celebrate that and show it in the landscape itself. Yeah. I think Thamesmead itself is such an important, um, probably a lesser known area of London. You know, it's on the outskirts. Yeah. Um, but it was really meant to be um, this utopic um, ideal in terms of architecture. And the, the architecture does kind of, it has a really significant presence. Um, you know, it's this kind of huge brutalist buildings, some of which are being pulled down now. So this is a really kind of delicate, um, you know, kind of observation. And for the second series that was part of um, Human Stories, Another England, um, photographers, and this is, uh, Theo was um, a part of this um, group show as well. And we kind of contrasted archival images that um, were meant to help us kind of reveal some of the underrepresented narratives of um, Black and Asian heritage in, in uh, the UK. And as part of that, we commissioned photographers to do um, a series of contemporary um, snapshots of, um, of youth and their, their kind of realities as well. So um, you chose to do this particular series, which was called Gurkha's Sons. So we, yeah, it would be great to learn a little bit more about this series. Yeah, I thought it'd be really interesting to, to look more into a 21st century um, community. Um, I'm half Nepalese and I think as it, since the turn of the century, there's been a lot of migration um, from Nepalese families because of the changes in the Gurkha settlement laws. So Gurkhas, um, um, have kind of fought for the British Army for over a hundred years but it's only since 2004 that they've had settlement rights here so since um, 2004 the population has increased from 6,000 to an estimated 100,000 so the Nepalese popularity, population has in increased massively um, and I was really interested in what the, these kind of young British Nepali um, particularly um, men in this in this instance what they kind of um how they were making their mark on the landscape what they were doing just kind of wanted to explore it as as being half nepalese myself um right. and how they felt about this idea of being british and nepali and um a friend of mine um pramila was um knew this group of boys called the k boys which stands for um kapruka the nepali word for frozen stiff and it's a reference for how they feel when they go out on their bikes in the cold English weather. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wanted to find out more about them. And she said that they did sort of club events and I wanted to kind of document them and, find, and talk to them and, and just kind of ex document them and, their, and what they were, what they're up to. And which areas of the UK did you... Um, yeah, they, they predominantly live in Aldershot, um, where the army base is. So that's where the bulk of the Nepalese community are in the UK. Right. So I went to Aldershot and the event where I actually shot them at, and it's an old like one of those amazing art deco cinemas and the building now uh, ha houses a temple mm -hmm. uh, and um, a restaurant and, is in, and it gets turned into a big party space for the Nepalese community. Oh. So I was quite interested in how this building had been used by different kinds of communities across the years and was being used at the moment for communities to come together. Brilliant. Thank you. And just before we um, look, touch on, on, on Theo's work, um, 
do you want to talk a little bit because I think this is quite an important publication and actually platform what we wore um, in terms of um, you know uh, understanding British subcultures visually and through photography this is such an important archive so um, just talk very briefly about about this project so what we wore um, is a people's history of British style so it's uh, an an archive that I built through collecting people's own images of their, their youth style. It's mostly kind of pre, pre digital. Um, so it's not images from Google or anything like that. It's images that were sourced and built through collections and, and building a, an archive where people could scan and bring their images and submit their images. But the idea was, of it was to really tell, tell the people's version of youth culture. So rather than it being by photographers, uh, a look from, from the inside out. Um, but it looks a lot at style and how people use style to express their identity. So actually it was so great to contrast these two bodies of work, which was Gurkha Sons, and we also used um, yeah. images from this collection as part of the archival selection um, of that um, show, which was actually, I should just mention that that show was in collaboration with Historic England. Um, so Theo, for, for human stories, I mean, your work explores um, black queer youth identity. Um, for human stories, you chose to kind of um, document a, a, a group of um, young men, but which I feel actually are, is probably an extension of your network of friends. It felt like you, you know, you know them quite intimately. So just, it would be great to understand a bit more about this um, project and um, why you chose to work with this particular group of, of men. Yeah, I think all, yeah, all the, um men boys subjects that i photograph are all like in my media community in the, within the black um london queer community mm -hmm. um also i just really want to like highlight them and celebrate them i think you know black you know black gay men have been, are so underrepresented you know within all realms of life and i wanted to show show their spirit and capture them you know in an empowering way and them just being free and being themselves and also just celebrate them as well. Brilliant. And um, how do you feel your work kind of resets this, this, this um, discourse around masculinity? I mean, I kind of think like, you know, the old dated uh, connotations of masculinity is like, you know, it's, you know, big muscles, you know, you have to be a really, you know, aggressive, like alpha male. And it's like, also, you know, you can be, you know, a man that wears makeup or dress effeminate or somehow, but that doesn't take away your masculinity. You're still a man. And, you know, so I kind of um, lost my train of thought. But um, no, I feel like, um, you know, what is masculinity nowadays? You know, the question is so wide open. Um, and I don't think there's one definite, you know, thing of like, oh, yeah, this is masculine, this is not. I think. You know, we all, you know, we're all men at the end of the day, just like, we turn out to be queers. <laughs> and um, I, I love this image so much. There's been so much um, talk about, um, you know, statues and, you know, yeah. what they represent or shouldn't represent. And um, this image to me just subverts that whole idea. Um, yeah. It's um, yeah. Shot in Soho Square, but uh, I think, when I was younger and I kind of didn't really know, I was still trying to find myself and I didn't really know much about gay life or have any gay friends. But I knew Soho, obviously, it's like, you know, the gay area of London, the community. So I'd always end up like going to Central on my own and going to Soho Square. So it has that, those memories of me just wandering and trying to find myself and trying to find people like myself. So it was important to photograph you know, the subjects within that environment. And as you can see, in you know, everyone's in a park just going about their business, but, and these, you know, the guys are kind of like there in the middle with the statue and, mm -hmm. you know, holding the force. And I think it's a really powerful image. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's just move on. So, um, and like this image, I feel like you capture, I mean, all the images are super confident, um, but there is a slightly underlying, um, you know, uh, a feel of fragility almost they're very unapologetic um how do you build an image when you um in terms of people and place how do you 
how do you um, rationalise that? I mean, it's kind of like a feeling. All of these images, because obviously working as a stylist as well, I think that a lot of my images are style-based. But mm -hmm. obviously with this series, the fundamentals were the subjects, but it's kind of wanting them to looking at their best. Um, so, like, this is Io, who's a good friend of mine. He's, like, you know, he's young, he's still trying to find himself. But I see so much of the younger version of me in terms of, like, you know, the strength and the wondering and also just finding yourself you know it's it's a very difficult minefield trying to navigate you yeah. know the journey and trying to like find out who you are and like what you're really about and also with society like you know I has got he he wears makeup sometimes like and you know and that's within itself is like a re revelation to people you know people see that and they freak out on the streets like oh my god they're like you know shouting batty yeah. All that and it's like you know what what's what's wrong with a bit of eyeliner do you know what I mean um so and yeah so kind of like I just want to celebrate them and really like hone in on the actual in the feeling that I get from each person well, it's, it's a really beautiful series I love this image yeah. <laughs> I'm going down memory lane now <laughs> <laughs> and how do well, you work how do you work with fashion designers as well? I mean, because you're, slight, you know, slightly different in that you um, are kind of an artistic director and stylist. So how do you work with fashion designers? Well, I kind of like, uh, it just depends on the, the project and the brief and what image I'm trying, what message I'm trying to convey. Um, and then also what's, because I always, I never really want to take the subject out of their world. I want to kind of just, enchant and inject myself into their world but the focus is still on them um yeah so i work with fashion designers all the time like collaborating um a few pieces of hair from like you know i like to work with younger designers as well um so like moa you know moa lola she's done um shot in our gallery yeah. there's a few pieces of hers here mm -hmm. um so i think yeah i think the fashion comes Second, it's more the subject and the message that I'm trying to convey with the image and then it's led by the fashion. Brilliant. And I wanted, because we're talking about youth subcultures, to also kind of um, ask you to kind of reflect on your own childhoods and um, how you feel about um, ideas of Britishness and um, actually sometimes that's contrasted with a feeling of otherness. So um, I did ask for you guys kind of bring in some photos of your um, childhood. So Nina, you, is this you, um, when was this in the kind of bottom left? Yeah, the bottom left, that's me when I was um, 16. Um, and I think my, um, my friend had dyed my hair in her bedroom and can cut it and um, going to get a photo booth. I obviously wore this purple lipstick and these these big white glasses and I think for me like I was quite shy as a teenager and style was a way for me to kind of show my alignment I think music and fashion very much went hand in hand then yeah um, the way that you kind of is the way that you expressed your individual identity but also formed a community of friends and I think that's what style has always been about for me that way that you can have your individual identity but also have a, a uniform and a group yeah um, and I was kind of, I was kind of like a weird, like indie kid, goth sort of punk. I don't know what I was, but I was a kind of a mixture of, I guess they were alternative subcultures. But at the yeah. same time, um, I don't know that, I think it felt like perhaps subcultures were less, um, there was less racial mixing. Mm. Um, and there was, you know, there was like, there was indie kids or rude girls. And it, there wasn't that, there wasn't the, the fluidity that there is today with the way that kind of music and fashion, I think, that, I think things are a bit different now and you can like lots of different things and I think there is more mixing. Do you feel that you, like you had to almost find yourself in a specific tribe? You to be, yeah, you sort of had to be one or the other really. Um, and I think, I think it's maybe a bit different now. I'd be interested to know what, what the audience think about that. But um, I, think, I think that London, as opposed to, I, I think, I always, being mixed was a big thing for me and I always, I always took um, mixtures for granted. So I think I went to quite a multicultural primary school and secondary school, so I never felt othered in a way. I felt, um, 
I felt like I fitted in around lots of people who were all had weren't necessarily white British, um, which I might have felt. I think I felt differently being outside of London, but I think London felt to me like a place where it was. It was everyone was was had, you know, different cultural backgrounds. So I felt comfortable there. Brilliant. And I just want to remind the audience that you um, can submit some questions in using the Q and A function, because um, we will then be asking those questions towards the end of the session. Um, and this image on the right. <laughs> The image of the girl. In yeah. the, um, so this is one. This is from my What We Wore collection, and um, I I think this is from this is probably like the mid nineties. But um, I just think her outfit's amazing. But I remember at the time I must have been you know like a teenager seeing looks like this and 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 they were kind of like different. But I really like them, and I think that like just just a really strong photo. So it's amazing to get this image submitted to the What We Wore archive and the story that came with it. Brilliant. And a young Theo here. <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, was obviously shot in Jamaica, some of these? No, these were actually in, shot in London. Um, I was born in Jamaica, but I came here when I was like seven. So, um, these were shot, a lot of them, the younger ones, were shot around that time when I just came to England. Um, but I think, you know, what, in terms of like heritage and like, you know, my beliefs, the fun that my Jamaican fun, that's always stuck with me. Just like, you know, what I learned like with roots and how my, you know, my grandmother was and you know, the things that she taught me about respect and how to carry yourself, et cetera. So I think my Jamaican-ness informs everything that it's in my being, but uh, you know, I've been saying that I've lived in England predominantly most of my life. Yeah. Um, so you know, I still identify as Jamaican, but I obviously, you know, I'm British by not default, but you know, I'm also British as well. Yeah, and how was it making that transition of from Jamaica to to the UK? Because I am I'm, I'm obviously from the Caribbean as well, and I I found it actually really being quite honest, really hard oh. to acclimatized to UK culture yeah. definitely felt like a, you know another and then you had to kind of find um, yeah yeah I feel like when you're young you're not really like you know you're not you, you're not so wise to the world and you know what's really going in the world so I think fundam I don't really feel any I think even if anything I feel more even other now <laughs> you know all those years than I felt then I kind of was just really excited. I remember when I first came to England, I saw snow, it was like a revelation. You know, I remember like eating a plum and it, that was a revelation. Um, but I feel, I came from really close knit in the sense of like my family just, you know, like communities would stay in their own communities. So my family were very much, you know, they were Jamaican, we just lived in East London, they worked in East London. But I always had like, I was always a wanderer, so I used to, you know, from a young age, I used to just, I knew that I had to educate myself and I had to make a world for myself. And I had, if I wanted to do something, I had to go out there and experience it and also, you know, find out who I am. So I got into a lot of, like, you know, I was interested in, I used to, do you remember, like, CDK, like, SMTV? No. <laughs> it's an old Saturday night show. So, sorry, Saturday daytime, like, pop show. Mm. So I used to go, this image of me and Kylie Minogue, I used to go to the studios, like, every Saturday because I was obsessed with, like, pop stars and, like, stars. <laughs> so I'd go every Saturday and, like, wait for the stars to go in. And um, that I was really excited about. It's something that I was just really excited about. When you're young, you just, you know, all these things are really fascinating to you. Um, so, and then also this image of me dancing, that was when I was 17. Oh. That was my first, uh, my first audition, my first job that I ever went to, um, was a Patti Boulay sun dance at the Hatney Empire. Oh. Um, I'd literally, no dance training. I kind of like my, I've heard about the audition. I went there and I was so excited. I was so determined to be a dancer. Oh. I literally just gave it my all. And, you know, so said so, and I got the job. And I think that was like a huge turning point for me because that, you know, with the cast having like different nationalities and sexualities, it was the first time 
that I was in close contact with other queer people. They were older than me, I was the youngest by far. But I think that was a huge turning point in my life. And like, actually, you know, you, you know, the world's your oyster. You can, you know, go out there and go for it. And also just be you, you know, there's nothing wrong with you, with your sexuality or, you know, just be. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for sharing those, both of you. And um, just to, briefly, just wanting to kind of talk about how you feel, um, you know, in terms of our, the narratives of kind of um, um, Black and Asian, you know, identity. Um, sometimes, you know, perhaps they are misrepresented and, and appropriated and just wanted to kind of um, ask your thoughts on, on that. I think what we've seen in the last maybe sort of 10, 20 years is people really taking more ownership to represent themselves. And that comes predominantly with, with the internet and digital culture. I think um, people are able to kind of like own their own identities more and represent them. I think what we wear for young people has always been a tool for expression and connection within youth cultures. But I think there's been a bit of a shift in the relationship between style and photography and the construction of the self through images in an age where like digital culture has kind of replaced the street as a place to connect. I think the flow of trends has really changed. So young people are really remixing their identities and like defining their own style identities and they can kind of share them in an instant with an audience. I also think there's diasporic identities become like a mark of pride. So yeah. young people are really kind of like embracing the ideas about their heritage and, and like sh showing them off and you know really celebrating them whereas in the past I don't think this was really the case. I think there's also been like a if you know a power shift for sure because young people have a lot more authorship over what they they are they are co generating content and you know they're consuming and also generating content at a, a rapid a rapid rate um so there is definitely a shift and and um you know you, you no longer look to one source for what um you know what someone should look like or how they should express themselves it's, it's quite multi-layered and the lens isn't always coming from the outside again it's coming from the inside and um, I think like, I think I, one of the images here is from a collective called the Muslim Sisterhood, who are kind of, um, I guess they're, they're building an archive of, of contemporary Muslim style and identity by themselves. No one else is documenting them from the outside. I think that's really exciting. I also put um, a slide in of MIA. This was um, taken by Liz johnson Arter for the Fader, um, I think maybe the mid 2000s. And I think mm -hmm. she's an interesting icon who is someone who's really come, tried to kind of celebrate her South Asian heritage, her British Asian heritage, um, and her kind of hybrid identity. So I think she's an interesting person to look at in the last 20 years. And I've, yes. also, I've also, just the, that the braid bar is an example of how, just, just ideas around cultural appropriation. Um, I think it's how, how quickly things can become commodified and how, how, I wonder how long young people can really own their own, take hold of what's theirs, you know? Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of discussion now about that um, yeah. and about imagery and actually who is, who owns that Im imagery in a way. Um, and um, Theo, do, do you have any ideas around um, or thoughts around appropriation? Um, uh, do I, I kind of think about, you know, I think with my work is always around, you know, black identity or black bodies as a subject. And I feel that for me, you know, why I started wanting to take my images because with, with my fashion work and, the, you know, the art direction, I kind of, I, I, I was, um, you know, when I was starting out, I was working with a lot of white photographers and, you know, being, you know, you know, obviously being a black man, I kind of like, it's, it's personal to me, the work that we were creating. And I just didn't feel comfortable, you know, having, you know, with this white gaze over the images, I felt like I didn't own them. You know, I felt kind of like, you know, I was giving my baby to someone else that didn't really understand the fundamentals of, you know, what the subjects and the images are. So I think, um, you know, it's definitely important to just, you know, own your own identity and, you know, and, you know, 
create the images that you want to. And I, we selected some images that kind of showcase how you, you know, you are both actively challenging those, you know, challenging narratives and how you use, often use the, um, the mechanics of fashion to do that. Um, Nina, can you quickly tell us a little bit about these two images here? Yeah, this is from a series called The New Mods, which I worked on with Getty, with an art director called Josie Gila. And um, I actually, I met these girls, I got a commission from um, American Vogue to go to London Modest Fashion Week. And I just, I just met these girls who just had amazing style. And um, I, I, I took their photos and whenever I shoot people, I generally try and get their, I always offer to give people their photos. Um, because I feel like, I don't know, it's, it's kind of, it's a nice exchange really. Um, I try and, it's, I guess it's like Leo was saying about casting, it's quite an important part of the process for me too. Um, and I stayed in touch with them. I, um, I was interested in Getty or trying to build a more diverse archive. So um, I got in touch with Josie there, one of the art directors, and we wanted to work on a project which was about celebrating modest style. Um, and what, uh, we ended up spending a day with um, the girls that I'd met at London, London Modest Fashion Week, documenting them in their every day. Um, it was over Ramadan, and but it wasn't style. The shoot wasn't styled at all. It was it was them wearing their own things. We got them to self style. Um, I think it's interesting that these image, images become stock imagery. I think some photographers wouldn't wouldn't want, necessarily want to produce mm -hmm. that. Actually, I think it's about How do you feel about that mainstream changing the mainstream perception of things and I mean, that's quite important as well yeah definitely um and yeah oh no no you can finish sorry um <laughs> it, was just, it was just i think what was really nice about this is it was um uh on one at, at home, the home of one of the girls so it's very much about people in their real environments but also they're slightly elevated and they possibly there's a kind of romantic sort of feel to them yeah and that's the kind of approach i like to take but i like to kind of spend time in people's environments and help them feel comfortable enough to be themselves so i can document that what their real life is like but with maybe with a kind of a romantic kind of edge edge to it yeah and, and that going back to that now gallery commission i feel like that's that's a similar approach as well yeah with the girls yeah yeah with the girls um and theo likewise um would you tell us a little bit more about these two works? Um, well, these two are kind of more like fashion images, um, but I kind of, with these um, images, I kind of like, I started with, I love the shirt and the fabric of this shirt, the blue shirt on the left. So I kind of like build the image around that. Um, and even with the background, it was important to have the colors tied in with that as well. But, um, and also with the jewelry as well. I think you know having you know men wear like feminine this woman's jewelry. I like to play with the you know the feminine masculine energies. So um, you know yeah, that's this was a really stylistic image. The other image with the trousers. I didn't. I realised at the time. You know, I kind of it's one of those things like sometimes when you're shooting something, especially though it's, it's a fashion shoot, you're not really realising the messages within, like behind the image, you're just thinking about the actual image. And when this came out, this was made in 2017, and it was literally, everyone went crazy for it. And I didn't really, I was like, why is everyone loving this image? But then I looked at it and it's like, you know, the trousers are really feminine. And, you know, he's in like, we shot this in like Tottenham in like the warehouses. And it's just, just the juxtaposition of like all these different worlds, like as you can see in the background, the image, and him sitting there, you know, his head down with these like rah rah trousers. Yeah, I just think it's be beautifully composed, and it's just um, got a, such a, a it's got a tender quality, but it's it is he's no lot no less strong um, through that image. So it's just really interesting how you. I think a lot of your work does bring that balance um, through. Yeah. And it's also, I always, um, I always try, I always respect the subjects. There's a lot of the models in, you know, a lot of these models are street cars and, you know, predominantly straight as far as my knowledge. So mm. can you imagine when I'm like, this is my idea? And they're like, ah. So I always, it's important for me to explain 
to the models, you know, especially, you know, what I'm trying to do, the message that I'm trying, you know, the image that I'm trying to create and yeah. the meaning behind it. Because I think, you know, if someone saw these images, they'll probably like, you know, oh my God, that's like gay or why has he got makeup on? Why has he got like, you know, stuff in his hair, you know? And so people, I always, I kind of leave that for people to come up with their own, you know, to digest the hi images how they want to. I kind of like enjoy that, just putting them out there for people to absorb them how they want. Um, but I think it's, like as black men as well, it's important to show all sides, you know, a feminine side, you know, masculine sides and, you know, diversity. Yeah, and to debunk those tropes. And it's, you know, it is a multifaceted identity. It's not just one, one way. Um, yeah these are beautiful as well i realize that time is escaping us so i'm gonna try and whiz through but um did you want to say a little bit about these ones or oh these images here oh well this kind of like the red image um this is called i love so nice and where you see the raw rizzles on the end of it it's kind of referencing the tenderness of like pureness of you know sex and love but then also the other the darker side of sex and love you know and also you know protection protecting yourself you know from all the elements that comes with you know love and you know and, and heartbreak and whatever happens in between that <laughs> they're beautiful and um just this next um question is just about lock down. Oh, actually, we had a question about, um, you know, how you connect and make people comfortable when you're working with them. This is Nina's image here. Um, I just like talking to people. I I'm interested in them. I don't see them as photographs, I see them as people. And I, I, I find it really hard if I go to another country and I can't speak the language, I find it hard to shoot because mm -hmm. I like to communicate and find out about people. So I think it's just, that's, it's a curiosity really. And because I think a lot of your work is street style, so it's, the, it's that interesting ability to make people, to approach people and make them feel confident and capture them. Yeah, I think often people are dressed in a certain way because they're actually drawing them towards you. They're in, they want people to kind of engage with them. Mm -hmm. um, and that, the, the clothing, the style might be a way of drawing people in. So they're interested in, I don't know, um, just getting approached. So the people that I approach are often happy to be to be photographed or they feel like they've been noticed or appreciated. And I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, lockdown as well and the projects that, you know, lockdown has been, it's been a really interesting time. It's, I feel, you know, a transitional time. I think for some people they've been able to channel their you know creativity and they've been able to pivot and find new um uh, hobbies or whatever that they're interested in but for a lot of people it has been a time where it's a bit kind of exhausting because of all how rapidly um you know our, our world is changing politically so I, I wanted to ask you um two things really firstly um how you kind of spent have been spending your time during kind of lockdown and what your learnings and observations are but also um, how you feel about this idea of protest and revolution that has obviously um, come to the fore and has been um, really kind of supported and, um, you know, carried by, by young people predominantly. So Theo, these are your images. So maybe you want to talk about your projects during lockdown. Yeah, I, mean, I had the crazy idea, like, I think it was like two weeks into lockdown, I kind of like, you know, I was really enjoying the stillness because, you know, our lives are so fast, you know, we're always on the go, go, go. And that's what I've been accustomed to. And then when obviously lockdown happened, it was like, oh my God, like what's, everything stopped. So it's kind of like, what am I going to do? Um, so I kind of like had this crazy idea of, you know, creating a publication um, to raise funds for the Queer TI PSC Hardship Fund. So, um, it basically, I started in April and we just released in June. Um, so it took about, I think like three months and that just, you know, it's a wide, you know, it's a massive project because, you know, artists of different backgrounds, sexualities. And I kind of just wanted, you know, I don't know, it, a lockdown brought the question of community and what is community. And I think more so than the actual work that I did, I realized a lot about myself and, you know, what, 
and what I didn't want, what I didn't like about or how my life was going previous to lockdown, mm. I, you know, I implement those changes that, you know, you really have to look after yourself. If you're not working, if you're not in line together, like, you know, nothing else is happening because, you know, it's just, it's just a mess. So, um, first of all, I had, yeah, I had a deja vu moment with that. Um, and then also, yeah, working on this project, you know, just, you know, bringing all people from different walks of life, from the community together in this one publication, you know, and unifying everyone and just like, you know, having, you know, everyone just come together. I think that was, you know, it's a really joyful moment. Really great. And you had um, contributions from um, people like Edward Enfel and um, yes. Paul. Yeah, I mean, like, I kind of like, I didn't know, I, I kind of just jumped into it and I like got in touch with like, you know, my friends first. And then like, you know, I really admire Anish Kapoor's work, you know, and I kind of just off the art shit, just emailed his studio and like surprisingly got back and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> But he was really supportive, and I think that was lovely to know that, you know, obviously Anish Kapoor is a massive artist, um, yeah. but that, you know, it really encouraged me that he was take, took the time out to, you know, contribute and create a new image for the project. You know, just in line, I was like, I was really cautious though, because I think some people that I'd approached, they weren't really in the mood to like, you know, create anything. They weren't feeling inspired during lockdown. And then yeah. some other were like feeling more creative and actually felt like they can they have something to contribute but I think you know with working on this project it's also brought me a lot of patience and understanding just for others you know just like you've got your own you know how you operate and how you work you know it's important to understand how others work as well and you know just respect people brilliant so I think we put some links on how you can um find out more about six foot and Nina, what were some of your observations during um, lockdown? I just want to say, Theo, it looks amazing, that project. Thank you. <laughs> I, didn't say it um, I haven't really done much work during lockdown because I've got a one-year-old. So I've mostly been at home um, looking That's after That's a lot of work. So it's, it's, <laughs> I haven't done much. Um, I, I kind of like, um, I haven't done much creative work in the way that I, I could before it's it's been it's been nice in some ways but um i feel a bit envious of, of that of having had that time i think it's really great that people have been able to kind of make stuff and and to raise money for for so many like important causes over this time it's nice to have been part of some of those projects but um yeah it just look, it looks really brilliant but um yeah i i was just gonna say it's the longest time i've never been on the london underground in my life it's like four months maybe five months and I just, I don't know, like, it's just a thought really that I just feel a bit, I think for me, like the underground um, is a place where people from different walks of life can cross paths that, that never would. And I think that's what's great about cities. And that's kind of what makes British subcultures um, and particularly London subcultures so interesting, I think is the kind of mixing. And I, I just feel a bit sad that the underground doesn't, and the streets don't feel like that kind of place. It's a little bit less so now, but it's it's a shame. I wonder when things will start feeling a bit more open again. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely kind of uh, revisited some of my, you know, old haunts like Brixton and so forth. And it's, it's just quite different, isn't it? Yeah. And hopefully in time it will start to kind of, you know, because it's, it's definitely how we connect um, with each other. And just on the, the idea of um, protest, as I mentioned, you know, it has been um, a, a very significant time um, and a shift in how, um, you know, we, we think politically and, um, you know, it, we've seen amazing images that have come out of um, what's happened with uh, the unfortunate incidents in um, America with George Floyd, etc. And just wanted to have you know both your idea, your thoughts on on um, this idea of revolution and, and protest, um, contemplating your work or and or work of the you know another photographer. Um, so Thea, tell us a little bit about this and, and your thoughts. I mean, like I think protest comes in like you know many different forms, and you know I kind of like maybe my protest is the work and the images that I create. I feel like that's probably like a protest within itself and like you know 
the the subjects and like you know the message that I'm trying to get across, especially when it comes to you know you know being black and the, you know being a black man. Um, so like these images were from a show called Oh Freedom, and you know I really want to just this image on the left with uh, I forgot the model's name, but in the red dress, this was kind of like based on the idea of you know the old racial stereotype from like you know from the eight like from late 18 like 70s where the stereotype around black people eating watermelons so you know there was quite a negative degrading you know um negative they were portraying black people in a negative degrading light so right. i kind of like you know take that and turn it on his head and like have it within this format and also just owning those images as well yeah awesome um these yeah Oh, sorry. You... No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to see if we can get some questions in towards the end. Oh, yeah. I would back, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I just wanted to show some um, these, just interesting how history repeats itself. This is, these are some images from 1978 um, when um, the Bengali community stood their ground against the racist murder of a textile worker, Altab Ali. So was, there was a big uprising in the streets of East London, there by a photographer called Paul Trevor. And I think that there are obviously more traditional protest images in a sense, but I just thought it was quite interesting to see th these um, alongside um, the more recent ones. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's an interesting point that, you know, obviously we've had this, it feels like we, there have been obviously loads of points in history where we have had this um, uh, feeling of uprising. And do we feel like um, this, there will be a lasting change now? Do we feel that there's anything that's slightly different this time around? Yeah, I feel like, I mean, I didn't protest myself because I wasn't able to, but I feel like with everything that's happening now, the Black Lives Movement, you know, there's definitely been a shift. And I feel that, you know, well, it needs to be, but it's a lasting shift. You know, we, things can't go back to where it was. You know, the gates have been open. Conversations have been had that were meant to be had, like, you know, from time ago. So I think, you know, well, looking forward, you know, things can only, you know, hopefully get better. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's been a shift and I think it, it has to happen on like an institutional level um, mm. with corporations and big organisations and within the within the education system. There has to be structural change over kind of pure lip service or rep representation. I think that there has been a shift. we will yet to see how, how it, will, it will take time, but I do think there's been a shift, like a major shift. Brilliant. I, I really hope that is for, for sure, you know, because... Um, Obviously, we do see, uh, again, we are all confronted, and I think that's this idea of why some of us feel so exhausted. We've been kind of like confronted with various imagery and, you know, different slogans and all of that over and over. And um, I think the worst thing is if it just is a whirlwind and it just doesn't kind of move on. Um, so hopefully um, there is a shift. So I wanted to thank both of you. Um, I, I think there's a, a point now we can have some questions from the audience. So I think um alicia is going to ask some questions yes um i've just launched a poll as well for the audience to answer the questions as well uh but the first question we have is from jemima and it's for nina she said lovely to see your images nina so strong and significant people are obviously very important to you is your subject matter always about personality um yeah i think it's it's definitely about um drawing out people's personality and how um, sort of style can be a tool for that. Um, I think like, I never think my work's about personality. I never think of it as being about that, but I guess it is because it's kind of about, it's about people and, but I'm also interested in how they, how they're part of something bigger, less about them as individuals. So about the communities that they're part of, I think. Uh, the next one is from Dahlia for Theo. She says, Theo, how did you get into photography and how did you find confidence when starting out? Well, I kind of like, I got into photography because I was working with a lot of photographers and it was kind of like, I, all the, the concepts and the ideas came from me and I kind of, it got to a point where I felt a bit uncomfortable like creating all this work and not being, you know, the actual one that's owning and taking the image. 
So I really started slowly. I started with disposable cameras, just like shooting things, shooting friends. And then when I started getting comfortable, you know, with actually to take like, a proper camera up, you know, it was a long process to actually get to that point. Because I don't know, it sounds really stupid, but I was just really, so I respect, so I respect photography and like so many great photographers that have inspired me. I thought, you know, if I'm going to take this camera up, I need to, you know, I need to have a message. I need to do that justice. But it's a slow process. So I think, you know, start small, like start with the disposable camera, point and shoot. And like, as you grow your confidence, you, you know, as you start shooting more, your confidence will grow. And then, you know, you might, you find, your own identity as you go along. Uh, the next one as well is from Jemima. She said, tribe is such a good term for understanding where you belong. Can you belong to many tribes? And if so, which are yours? This is both me and fear. I think in a weird way, I've, I've always never belonged to one tribe. I've always been kind of in between tribes. So, but I think you can kind of, I guess the whole idea of a tribe is that you are, you're one, you're together, but I've always been kind of like on the outside of things. Yeah, I kind of, for me, I think my tribe, if you're supposed to put it as that, you know, would be like, you know, the black queer community and my circle of friends and the wider community. But I, you know, but I've also got other tribes in different, you know, different communities but I also, you know, they all come together somehow and that informs, you know, the person that I am. Uh, so the next one is an anonymous question. They said, when shooting new models, i.e. strangers, do you prefer to get to know them beforehand or go in blind? If the former, what do you talk about? Um, I, I don't know. I always, because to me, it's like, you know, there's nothing worse than like, you know, getting a model on set and they're just like, you know, they're not really like in the spirit of what's happening. So for me, it's very important to explain to them, you know, the image that I'm trying to take and explain to them the ideas behind it to make them comfortable. So then that, you know, once the model is comfortable and they fully understand, then you will get a good image. Otherwise, if the model is not engaging, you know, it's clear to see that there's that distinct between the image and the model. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, I like to know the people, or I like to have had a conversation with them at least, because they're they're models, but they're people really, and they've, everyone's got something interesting or a story. It's it's I, I'm like, it's interesting to be able to draw that out of a person. Great. Do you have one more? Yes, yes. one yeah. final question. It's again lastly from Jemima. Uh, she said, love these photos of when you were both young, Thea and Nina. How much did you think your aesthetic has changed since you were young? Uh, I think when I'm, I don't know, in terms of, I've always, you know, been interested, like, you know, in colour, in pop art, you know, different subcultures. So I kind of feel like it's just, if anything, as I've got older, it's just informed and grown and building on these, you know, these, you know, ideologies that I kind of grew up on and like was investigating and curious about. Yeah, same, same as what Theo's saying. Really, you can see, you can see the things that you kind of come back to, again and again. It's funny how you think. I don't know, like, yeah, I say my like sort of pattern, like colours, and there's something. I don't know, like, like the the original image in the, in the beginning of Shepherd's Bush Market. And the textiles, and I don't know, just things like that. There's, there's that aesthetic. I'm still interested in that, so it comes back. And it's also feeling as well. You know, it's feelings and memories. So um, I think that's yeah, that's got a lot to do with this. All these components that all come together. Great, thank you. Thanks, Alicia. Um, thank you both for sharing so much about your practice um, i think it was a you know great discussion and thanks for giving of your time um, i want to also thank everyone who's joined our talks during the lockdown period um, now gallery is uh reopening in september so please do um keep abreast with our website uh for updates on uh exhibition dates thanks everyone Thank you. Thank you. That was really fun. Thank, Thank you. you.